I have selected bacterial meningitis, which is going to be one of the key things uh, which most of the neurology medical officers and junior doctors in uh, medical wards come across regularly. Uh, and I have designed this talk based on common questions which we uh, face in day-to-day -day practice. And I'm, hope, I'm sure that uh, you will uh, uh, find most of the answers that you look for every day practice. So the question number one is, what is the correct terminology which we should use in CNS infections? Uh, as you all know, if you look at the central nervous system, it comprises of uh, different structures in the brain and the uh, surrounded organs. Uh, mainly the covering uh, tissues, meninges and cerebral hemispheres, cerebellum, brain stem and uh, spinal cord. So these are the main structures in central nervous system. So when you get infection in any of these structure that is come under uh, comes under central nervous system infections so we use different terminologies to describe infections in central nervous system as you all know meningitis encephalitis myelitis meningoencephalitis cerebritis ventriculitis cerebral abscess and epidural abscess so these are the different terminologies which we commonly use to describe infections in central nervous system. So how are we going to classify them? So as you see, there are a number of terminologies we use to def uh, define or describe different infections in the central nervous system. So we need some sort of classification, which we commonly use. Most of the clinicians, they prefer to use a classification based on anatomical structures, especially in this uh, CNS infection. Now, if you look at meninges, if the infection is involving meninges, you call it meningitis. And if it is uh, involving brain parenchyma, you call it encephalitis. If it's in the spinal cord, it is myelitis. Likewise, you define or nominate uh, depending on the anatomical structure. Or else, some people prefer to use depending on the microorganism involved in the uh, particular infection. So if it's a bacterial meningitis, viral or fungal, so you further define the uh, anatomical structure with associated microorganism. So today's talk, I'm particularly uh, uh, focusing meninges causing, uh, back, menin infection in meninges causing bacterial. So it is bacterial meningitis. So if you again look at the uh, practical anatomical classification for meninges, if you look at this, uh, the diagram over there, it shows uh, the skull, dura mater, and uh, subarachnoid space and pia mater. So the commonly the infections occur in uh, subarachnoid space and pia mater, where there are a lot of blood vessels and uh, uh, tissues uh, which are uh, easily inflamed. So we call if the arachnoid space or sub, uh, sorry, arachnoid, subarachnoid space or pyamata is involving, that is leptomeningitis. If the infection is predominantly involving dura matter, we call it patchy meningitis, which is relatively rare. So other things, you know that if it's brain parenchyma, if it is a focal infection, you call it cerebritis or cerebral abscess. And if it is diffuse brain parenchyma, you call it encephalitis. And sometimes you see the combinations, meninges and brain parenchyma both get infected. Then you call it meningoencephalitis. And if sometimes brain and the cord, spinal cord get infected, then you call it encephalomyelitis. So it all depending on the anatomical structures. That's how you usually use the correct terminology. Use the correct the learning points, learning point one, use the correct terminology depend on the anatomical site involved. So another question which we come across very frequently is how to make a clinical diagnosis in bacterial meningitis. Now to know the uh, 
uh, clinical diagnosis, we have to familiar with the clinical symptoms. To analyze the clinical symptoms, we have to familiarize with the pathophysiology behind the clinical process. So if you look at the pathophysiology of bacterial meningitis, it is meningeal infection generally originated in two ways. One is directly uh, the uh, infection after traumatic injury or invasive procedures involving the brain or the, some other place. The organ microorganisms uh, uh, enters into the bloodstream or else infections in uh, some other organs causing uh, uh, leaking these bacteria and microorganisms into the bloodstream and they all process blood brain barrier even though it's a barrier there is a, a rare chance of crossing this blood brain barrier if those organisms process the blood brain barrier there will be infection so um, inflammatory reactions occur due to the bacterial infection in the uh, meninges and especially in the information of subarachnoid space and the pia matter and that will re this inflammatory reaction causes fever headache neck rigidity chronic signs and all so your pathophysiology explains the clinical symptoms if you look at more carefully you will be able to appreciate the clinical events depending on this each pathophysiological correlation if you again look at them now fever and headache are the common features in the early phase that is due to the pro inflammatory cytokine activity due to bacterial invasion and then you see the meningism confusion and uh, reduced csf glucose level in csf hmm? that is due to the subclinal encephalopathy again due to cytokine activity and other chemical mediators and then the patient going to impaired consciousness and sometimes elevated CSF pressure, increased CSF protein and focal neurological symptoms. That is due to the breakdown of the blood brain barrier and transendothelial immigration of leukocytes and causing cerebral edema. And further uh, deteriorates in uh, intermediate stage, the CSF pressure goes up further and causing sometimes vasculitis. As a result, clinically you will see seizures, focal neurological symptoms and signs including cranial nerve palsies. And later on, if the whole pathological process progresses further, then you get paralysis, cognitive impairment, coma and even death eventually. So this is a pathophysiological and clinical correlation which will explain you how these symptoms appear and those symptoms will help you to make a uh, clinical diagnosis. So high degree of suspicion and clinical diagnosis is important in treating bacterial meningitis. So that is learning point number two. Another question we see in a lot of clinical scenarios, how to elicit essential signs that is mainly for junior medical officers, junior doctors. Uh, uh, so if you look at the key uh, physical signs, specific for meningitis uh, assessment one is Koenig sign the other one that is uh, uh, how do you this is this shows how to do it accurately because accurate physical the, uh, the examination techniques are key to elicit the physical signs correctly now if you look at the Koenig signs which is we predominantly do with uh, pediatric age groups but still even in adult bacterial meningitis, it is important if you practice in your daily um, uh, routine examinations, whenever you suspect a uh, patient, whether the patient is having bacterial meningitis. Now, how to do it? You flex the knee, hip to 90 degrees, knee to 90 degrees, and then extend knee. And if you, if the patient uh, experienced pain and uh, extension is limiting due to pain, then you have elicited positive Koenig sign. Rudzinski sign or neck rigidity, that again, if you uh, you have to relax the neck first, take off the pillow and relax the neck and then bend the neck. And if you are not 
quite sure, then it is easy and more accurate if you ask the patient to uh, flex hip and knees, then it will be more accurate. So eliciting clinical signs, mainly Kernicks and uh, Brudzinski, which are specific for meningitis or meningism, are accurately, if you do it accurately, that is very, very important in bacterial meningitis diagnosis. And how to plan investigations? Now, if you look at CNS infection, it is very clear that we have to have a very straightforward plan to um, investigate. Wherever you see the patient, uh, whatever the specialty, the plan is more or less the same. CSF is the key thing which is specific for uh, specific for bacterial infections or the or meningitis or encephalitis. If you are uh, uh, if you are suspecting, so what are the things that you are going to look at? CSF examination, open pressure, gram stain, cell the full report, protein, sugar, culture, PCRs and bacterial antigens. Blood culture is very very important. If you do it in early stage, before uh, commencing antibiotics, full blood count and anti uh, sorry, inflammatory markers, including serum prolac uh, procalcitonin and CRP, they are very important to uh, get a clue whether a patient is having a bacterial infection or not. PCR are important to analyze it, the specificity specific uh, bacterial type and uh, whether it's bacterial infection or not. So going back to uh, CSF analysis, which is the most important part in analysis, uh, evaluating a central nervous system infection patient. So opening pressure, if you look at it uh, in bacterial meningitis and tubercular meningitis, uh, even in cryptococcal meningitis, they go up, the, it goes up and White cells are again high in both the bacterial and tuberculous meningitis. Uh, in polymorph, polymorph nuclear cells, lymphocytes are predominantly high in viral and sometimes uh, uh, tuberculous meningitis. Other things I will describe more in detail later. Uh, and the other important thing is uh, the gram staining which we usually don't see in our uh, clinical setups, but if you inform the microbiology team and do it properly, there are a number of instances we can see the organisms in gram stain. And that is very important to make a initial understanding of the type of microorganism involved, whether it's a bacteria or viral, and if it is a bacteria, the type of bacteria. So, it is important to discuss with microbiology and uh, microbiology teams and arrange gram staining. If they do it accurately, there is a higher chance of eliciting gram positivity. And that is important to make a decision on relevant antibiotics at initial stages. Now, furthermore, on CSF analysis and interpretation, the protein level usually elevated in both viral, bacterial and viral due to increased permeability of the blood brain barrier, but it is typically greater in bacterial and tuberculous meningitis. It's more than 100 milligram per deciliter. CSF protein should be corrected for traumatic tap. If sometimes in practical settings, we see a lot of uh, lumbar punctures are traumatic. So if it's a traumatic lumbar puncture, your proteins, protein levels can uh, give the wrong interpretation if there are higher number of red cells, there is a, uh, some uh, simple equation to deduct 0 0.01 gram per liter for every thousand red cells if the tap is traumatic. CSF sugar, usually low in most of the bacterial meningitis and tubercular meningitis. However, uh, 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 from viral uh, infections, herpes simplex and uh, mumps 
infections can show low sugar levels a ratio if it's less than half the 100% sensitivity of a bacterial infection but the specificity is low when it's further low like lower than 0.23 that's uh, 25 uh, less than 25% then the specificity improves to 99% uh, again if you are, if the patient is hyperglycemic a diabetic patient with poor uh, glycemic control the csf glucose level cannot correlate the fraction cannot correlate with the random blood sugar level because random blood sugar level is more than 120 the csf sugar comes to a plateau you may not be able to accurately uh, correlate and say that the ratio is less than 50% or 25% so that is something that you have to keep in mind csf analysis and interpretation again Mm, culture the sensitivity of culture is high if you collect properly and before starting antibiotics antigens even though it is not available in our setups most of the western countries they do uh, straight away the uh, strep pneumonia which is one of the commonest microorganism causing bacterial meningitis so they do uh, antigens so if antigen specificity is very high uh, in pneumococcal meningitis pcr not so commonly doing it but it is possible so learning point number 4 cerebral spinal fluid analysis is the single most important investigation in cns infection so you have to do it early and interpret results accurately another question which we see regularly is when to do these investigations now we see in clinical practice most of the uh, bc wards they postponed investigations and they try to start treatment but what does guideline say now if you look at any guideline now it has come to a kind of very consensus uh, among all the clinical guideline formulating authorities and the main one is infectious disease uh, uh, society of american guideline and including that and many other guidelines that clearly given instructions to do blood culture immediately every time as if possible before commencing antibiotics and that will give you a very good uh, specificity and uh, specificity if you look at the culture positivity and activity so that you have to do immediately before commencing antibiotics lumbar puncture as early as possible if possible before commencing antibiotics immediately if there is a delay it is not a reason to delay antibiotic you have to start antibiotic but after first dose you can do lumbar puncture immediately unless there is no a valid contraindicated contraindication and then to start empirical antibiotics together with iv steroids so this is the summary of most of the guidelines on bacterial meningitis management this is again the same thing in an algorithm so i will skip that so learning point number 5 immediate blood culture is essential blood culture should be done immediately before starting antibiotic and the question number 6 when do we have to delay lumbar puncture now when do we have to delay lumbar puncture that is uh, because now most of the wards most of the bc units medical emergency neurology wherever there's a higher tendency to see that i have done an audit some time ago and it has clearly shown that they there's a quite a significant delay in performing lumbar puncture even though they suspect um, bacterial meningitis and even though they start the empirical antibiotics appropriately they un uh, there's undue delay in Uh, performing lumbar puncture but if you look at the 
guidelines there are certain uh, conditions where we have to delay it if there is a sign if there are signs of severe sepsis obviously patient is in shock you have to delay it if the patient has severe respiratory or cardiac compromise then again you have to delay it until patient is stable if the bleeding risk is high if you can see any reasonable uh, indicator to show that bleeding risk is high then you have to uh, delay it and if you can elicit uh, evidence of shifting brain compartments like uh, ct brain uh, then you have to do a ct brain prior to doing a lumbar puncture what are those uh, focal things uh, the brain compartment shiftment indicators if you see the focal neurological signs if the patient has evidence of papilledema or patient is having uncontrolled seizures or low gcs then you have to do a ct scan of the brain on contrast prior to performing lumbar puncture otherwise there is no reason for you to do a ct before lumbar puncture you can straight away go for lumbar puncture after your clinical assessment if there is the learning point number 6 that is very very important in practical clinical setups if there is no contraindication lumbar puncture should be done as early as possible and ct is not a must to perform prior to lumbar puncture so when do we need ct before lp the just to recapitulate the same thing again if you are suspecting uh, uh, dealing with a patient with immunocompromised state there's a higher chance of having uh, space occupant lesion and all so then you can delay it and wait till the uh, ct if you are dealing with a patient with other central nervous system disorders then again it is warranted if the patient is having new onset seizures papilledema altered level consciousness and focal neurological deficits then it is okay to do a ct scan of the brain before lumbar puncture and another common question lot of people ask is when do we have to repeat lumbar puncture do we have to repeat lumbar puncture or when then when to do it uh, so it is not commonly we practice and we do not repeat lumbar puncture frequently for each and every case of meningitis that is only to look for the response so we if we can appreciate the clinical improvement and if we think that clinical response is good then we do not have to repeat lumbar puncture but if the patient is having persistent fever high inflammatory markers even after completing the mm, antibiotic course then of course yes you have to repeat lumbar puncture and see whether you are dealing with some other infection right and uh, if the patient is developing new neurological signs then you do not have to wait for completion of the antibiotics if the patient is deteriorating further or getting new neurological signs then even if you are not if you not have completed uh, the, uh, the antibiotic course still you can repeat the lumbar puncture and see the evidence of any other neurological condition or let's say autoimmune encephalitis or autoimmune type of neurological process or it can be there are different type of infections like tb meningitis or um cryptococcal meningitis so you have to repeat it and plan out the investigations depending on the clinical picture and how to differentiate bacterial from viral meningitis now if you look at the clinical features which we have which we have discussed earlier that is not specific for bacterial the nuchal rigidity um a fever headache uh, and uh, even reduced conscious level they all can uh, can be common to bacterial and viral meningitis is it important to differentiate bacterial and viral uh, clinically yes if you can that is good because if you are treating unnecessarily with antimicrobials then you can prevent it but you do not have to do it because viral meningitis is usually has a uh, uh, spontaneous recovery so you do not have to worry too much about viral meningitis the detrimental problem is bacterial meningitis so if you treat it even though it is viral you are not doing any harm to the patient 
so differentiating bacterial from viral is not essential but if you can you there are certain tools that you can use to differentiate one is elevated crp that inflammatory markers are high then it is in favor of bacterial infection if you do csf gram staining properly that will definitely give a uh, positive bacterial uh, if it is positive then it uh, it is in favor of bacterial low csf sugar as i mentioned earlier if it is mums or herpes simplex then you uh, even if it is viral the sugar levels can go down but usually if sugar levels are low then it is in favor of bacterial elevated csf lactate though we don't do it very um, frequently it is helpful the one important thing is elevated serum procalcitonin procalcitonin as you all know that is an indicator of bacterial infection so we can do serum procalcitonin in most of the uh, uh, teaching hospitals nowadays so that is important if you are really if you really want to differentiate it that is an important thing the pcr again we don't do very frequently then how to decide on treatment why do we have to consider antibiotics early now you all know that in bacterial meningitis early commencement of antibiotic is essential why do we have to do that now there is there are no uh, uh, studies which we have done to look at how early we have to treat because nobody want to take a risk and make a trial out of that but if you look at the poor prognostication factors delaying starting antibiotics is one of the uh, key independent variables associated with poor prognosis so one when you see that you know that treating early is an essential thing so uh, you have to start antibiotics as early as possible then if you are starting antibiotic early how are you going to make a decision which antibiotics to use so for that you have to have antimicrobial uh, the idea about antimicrobial susceptibility for that again you need epidemiological evidence data and studies to show which what are the common organisms in your um, locality and what what is the susceptibility of antibiotics in those uh, causative microorganisms but unfortunately in sri lanka we don't have enough evidence to say what are the type of uh, microorganisms uh, occurring uh, commonly it's it's common that it is pneumococcal meningitis but there are certain other things coming up in time to time we do not have adequate accurate up to date data on those things uh, if you look at pneumococcal meningitis alone which is the commonest among the world the penicillin susceptibility is 96.1 so fairly good susceptibility but if you look at the susceptibility to third generation cephalosporins it is 98.3 even better so third generation cephalosporin is a good choice the other common organism is nine nicety uh, the meningitis which reduce susceptibility to which has a fairly low susceptibility to penicillin it is 82 but for cephalosporins it has a fairly high susceptibility so third generation cephalosporin mainly ceftriaxone and cefotaxime should be used as empirical therapy and further deciding on which antibiotic to be used these are the common organisms which we see streptococcus pneumoniae and neisseria meningitis both are uh, both have fairly good susceptibility for third generation cephalosporin but if you look at streptococcus pneumoniae there are mm, certain strains which are cephalosporin resistant so adding vancomycin is a good thing even in sri lanka that is recommended in america and most of the western countries even in sri lanka the microbiology college has uh, identified number of cases with uh, uh streptococcus pneumonia resistant variety so then it is important to uh, 
add vancomycin if it is uh, a suspected uh, third generation cephalosporin resistant variety the other one is listeria monocytogens that is if you are suspecting uh, in extreme age age groups and immunosuppression uh, people uh, the interesting listeria is not susceptible for third generation cephalosporin so adding ampicillin no amoxicillin is important this is again the same thing but if you look at the uh, iatrogenic uh, meningitis either due to uh, neurosurgical uh, intervention penetrating or penetrating trauma then adding vancomycin and uh, third generation cephalosporin is not adequate you have to consider vancomycin with cefepim ceftazidim or mirapenem so that is another important thing especially if you are treating a patient with previous brain uh, injury penetrating brain injury or neurosurgical procedure so just to recapitulate the same thing again these are the three regimes which we usually use ceftriaxone or cefotaxime the alternative therapy is mirapenem unless they are not responsive adding vancomycin if you are dealing with a patient with penicillin and cephalosporin resistant type of pneumococcal uh, meningitis and ampicillin and amoxicillin if listeria is suspected and the other point is missed that is uh, if it's iatrogenic or penetrating trauma related meningitis then consider um Uh, vancomycin plus ceftazidim or mirapenem so the next question or automatically comes is how long do we have to continue if you are not sure with the organism give a broad spectrum the previously suggested regime for uh, 10 days if you confirm the organism if it's meningococcal or influenza 10 to 7 days if it's streptococcus pneumoniae uh, for 14 days and you are suspecting listeria monocytogen treat it for 21 days now learning point 7 depending on the risk factors decide on most appropriate empirical antibiotic regime question number 8 what is the place for steroid in bacterial meningitis now you know that subarachnoid space inflammatory response increase micro uh, morbidity and mortality how to reduce the inflammatory response if you start steroids together with antibiotics you can reduce the uh, inflammatory response and that will reduce the cerebral edema uh, in, uh, the pressure won't go up then uh, increase the cerebral blood flow and minimize the cerebral vasculitis so it is important to start steroid together with antibiotics there's a landmark uh, uh, study came up in 2002 the dexamethasone in adult bacterial meningitis it had shown uh, def- definitive favorable outcome uh, and it is minimizing the unfavorable outcome in other words uh, if it with dexamethasone group it's quite uh, low unfavorable outcome so it is recommended in all the guidelines to start dexamethasone iv uh, for 6 hourly for 48 hours or four days in some guidelines so at least you have to give 48 hours so learning point number 8 administer iv dexamethasone together with first dose of antibiotics Now, what are the different bacterial meningitis even though i am not going to discuss in detail there are two other important type of uh, which are uh, uh, which are usually not not behaving like common uh, bacterial meningitis it's not encephalitis sometimes it's, it's minim- mimicking the features of encephalitis that is listeria monocytogens you get brain stem involvement and having some features of meningitis as well as encephalitis 
It is involving the extreme age groups and immunocompromised patients. The key thing is, to, if you are suspecting it, adding ampicillin together with cephalosporins and vancomycin. And the other one is mycobacterium tuberculosis, where you need very high degree of clinical suspicion to make a diagnosis of possible tuberculous meningitis. It has very uh, quite a different spectrum of clinical presentation, different treatment plan. So it's going to be a different lecture, which I'm not going to discuss today. So learning point number nine, you have to remember there are certain uh, bacterial meningitis which behave differently, especially TB. So to make a diagnosis, you have to have a high degree of clinical suspicion. Question number 10, can we predict the prognosis of bacterial meningitis? Yes, there are certain uh, unfavorable outcome predictors which have been identified in different uh, uh, studies. Uh, if you are dealing with an uh, immunosuppressed patient, if the patient is having internal comorbidities, if the antibiotic commencement is more than 48 hours, it's delayed more than 48 hours, on admission, GCS is low, or if, you, if the patient is having hypotension or uh, septic shock, then the outcome is not very good. So these are the uh, unfavorable outcome predictors. So the learning point number 10, early identification and treatment minimize the morbidity and mortality in bacterial meningitis. So all in all, what you have to remember is these 10 essential uh, facts, which is going to help you in daily practice. Right. This is the same 10 pearls that we have discussed earlier. It's repetition of the same thing. So thank you very much. And I hope that it is going to help you to improve your clinical practice in practical meningitis.